Hello, welcome to Herb Corner, where we'll be discussing the Bismarck Ringed Python, also known as Bothro Bothrochilus boa, or known in German and Luxembourgish as Bismarck Swerg Putzon. Probably butchered that. They're a nocturnal boa that sports black and red or orange rings along their bodies. Their eyes are pitch black. They start at around 1 or 2 feet and quickly grow to 5 or 6 feet. Their lifespan often goes up to around 20 years, give or take. Similarly to tricolor hognoses, most specimens' color fades as they grow older. Younger Bismarck ringed pythons have bright red stripes, whereas most older ones turn into a golden brown with a highly saturated yellow underbelly. Some people have mentioned them looking uglier as adults, to which I say, no, stop talking. In UVB light, their scales appear iridescent, much like the Brazilian rainbow boa. Similarly to the Calabar Python, which we've covered in the past, the Bismarck Ringed Python has hosted quite a bit of controversy regarding their name, specifically the, gen the genus of their scientific name. I mean, there is some controversy to be had about their specific epithet as well. A specific epithet is the, par is the second part of an animal's scientific name. For instance, this species' specific epithet is boa, which is odd since they're, you know, a python. But that's not the main source of unrest in regards to their taxonomy. It is instead the genus. Their genus, Bothrochilus, is what they settled on in 1843. They actually share a genus with the more well-known white-lipped python, kind of like having a famous cousin, though I personally think the ringed pythons are cooler. Taxonomists originally considered grouping these guys in with olive pythons or green tree pythons. Can <laughs> you imagine? Fun fact, boa in Portuguese means good. Very good indeed. The Bismarck Ringed Python is judged by the IUCN Red List as least concern due to them being fairly common in the Bismarck Archipelago, right off the coast of Papua New Guinea in Indonesia. Though it's notable that there is some risk of, for their population numbers coming in from the reptile trade, since there have been instances of importers catching and selling wild-caught ringed pythons. They're found in the entirety of the Bismarck Archipelago, as well as, as, well as all of the nearby islands. In the wild, their natural conditions consist of rainforests, humid shrublands, and grasslands, and even some farmland. Most sightings of this species are of them in coconut husks. They're used to wet, soft soil, often burrowing through it as fossorial animals, and they were discovered by Leopold Fitzinger, an Austrian zoologist in 1843. Their care is argued arguably the most documented aspect of them. Many experienced keepers of the Bismarck ringed python will tell you that they are very much not beginner animals. The main reason would be the high humidity levels they require. Papua New Guinea has high temperatures and very high humidity levels. This tells us that a reasonable humidity level would be around 80%, which is a lot harder to manage than you'd think. The best way to keep this would be layers and layers of plantation soil with sphagnum moss mixed in. If you've experience with mosses, consider cultivating some in this enclosure. Since you're using real soil, make sure to have an appropriate drainage layer. Could be composed of hydro balls or rocks or anything else you have available. There should also be provided plants and a nice variety of cleanup crews. Most common types of cleanup crews would be springtails, isopods, and or millipedes. Pay attention to the population of the animals you introduce. If it ever gets too high, consider selling some or introducing some of them to introducing some of them to one of your other enclosures. Another thing I'd like to note is the fact that since this would be technically bioactive, it's important to keep your animal out of the enclosure for the first one or two weeks after introducing all of these aspects. This is something you need to do so the snake doesn't experience the first mold bloom, or doesn't muck with the isopod population too much, or doesn't screw up the plant roots. After the first one or two weeks, there will probably be established root systems and consistent population numbers for the isopods, or whatever you choose for the cleanup crew. There isn't really any easy alternative to bioactive in this case, since non-bioactive enclosures can lead to any soil within them becoming acidic. Another thing that helps humidity levels would be a good water bowl, one that the snake can for lack of a better word, step into, but it can't be deep enough for them to drown. I'd recommend a 30 gallon glass enclosure or vision cage as the ideal. Some might say a tub is fine, which I guess. Just in my and a few others experiences, snakes do better with heat lamps than they do with mats, which you'd need if you, want the, if you went the tub route. And like most other snake species, they do not do well with cohabbing. 
Other than that, you could leave a hide in there for them, but it's not necessary since they'll be buried most, most of the day. It should be fairly hot on one side of the enclosure with a thermal gradient so the snake can thro thermal regulate easily. As stated in other installments, I recommend heat lamps over heat pads, since even fossorial species I've cared for have taken advantage of basking spots, and overall, lighting adds more aesthetics to the enclosure, but that might just be me. The basking spot should be a temperature of 88 degrees Fahrenheit, or 31 degrees Celsius, while the cool side should be 80 degrees Fahrenheit, or 26 degrees Celsius. Since the entirety of the enclosure should be fairly humid, there's no need for a humid hide, unlike most other species we cover. Shedding, like most snakes, should be all in one piece if the conditions are right. This can actually be a pretty good way to know if your husbandry for them is up to snuff. Them shedding in pieces can suggest that they're not getting enough nutrients, not getting enough water, or a variety of other health problems. So it's generally a good idea to keep an, an eye on their almost tri-weekly shed. Sometimes tri-weekly, tri sometimes they'll go more than five weeks without shedding. That's normal to make sure that they get the nutrients they need, feeding them based on their size is necessary. Very, very young, small specimens should be fed a pinky once a week. After they get a little bigger, you can start making the meals larger. Definitely never, th never anything bigger than a large mouse. You can always size their meals based on the girth of the largest part of the snake. As a guess, I'd say when they're adults, a weaned mouse or a mouse hopper would be appropriate. S something optional you could do is dust them with reptocalcium. Only occasionally, though, you don't want them to be overloaded. Also, important to mention that as they grow, you should feed them a little bit less often. Once every other week is perfectly fine for an adult of their size. Never ever feed them any more than once a week. Some breeders do that so females can reach a breeding age faster, but it effectively cuts their lifespan in half. Another thing to mention is the fact that some owners have reported their snakes being finicky eaters, so don't worry if they go off feed for a little while. Even though they're completely different families, my Kenyan sandboa, which are known to be picky, once refused food for six months straight. She's do she's still doing great weight-wise, and recently started eating again. Snakes can go off food for miraculously long periods of time. It's, you know, just something natural for them. So don't worry if that happens to yours. Still keep attempting to feed them on a regular basis, just in case they do start eating again. And, of course, don't handle them 24 hours within their last meal. But anyway, speaking of handling, they're comparable to the typical Wilma python in that regard. Skittish and squirmy. <laughs> they're not known to bite, unlike Wilma pythons, though looking at their average temperament, handling may often be stressful for the snake, so only handle if you, if you do so on a consistent basis so as to get them used to it. Otherwise, save it for only when needed. Of course, the first few weeks of getting the Bismarck ringed python avoid handling so they can more easily get used to their new environment. Breeding for the Bismarck ringed python in general isn't talked about much, if not at all. They lay at most uh, 12 eggs, and breeding season has been speculated to be roughly late winter. There is no known sexual dimorphism for this species. I've heard they're often finicky when it comes to actually producing fertile eggs. However, some have recommended that before you pair the male and the female, starting from October until late January, drop the nighttime room temperatures to 70 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, or roughly 21 degrees Celsius. Another good tip I've heard from breeders of this species is to pair the female with multiple males. If you would like to learn more about ringed python breeder's experience, I'd recommend this specific thread from reptileforums.co.uk on the matter. Every single person there has very has something very interesting to say about the snakes, like for instance how to put, figuratively, more lead in your male's pencil, or pencils, since snakes have two peens. Anyway, since they're oviparous, any breeder will likely need to understand the basics of some type of incubator. As per use, as people say, I'd recommend for you to go out and do your own research on this matter, since to be honest, I have no idea where to start since I know nothing on that topic specifically. A lot of really good info regarding making an incubator is shared in the book Reproductive Husbandry of Pythons and Boas by Richard Ross. And oh my god, $700 for a paperback. Okay, well, I've heard from a lot of breeders that even if some of the info in it is a little out of date, there is still some really good tips in there. So maybe, if possible, find other means of reading the book. Only the most legal ones, of course. I mean, 
But I think that's going to be all for this installment of Herb Corner. As always, sources will be in the description. If you're interested in the topic, I'd recommend looking further into their husbandry or history. If you learned something new with this one, feel free to subscribe. I do these every other week. Like the video to support the channel. Have a good evening, morning, or afternoon. Thank you for listening, watching, whatever. And I'll see you next time.